a question for your Turbo LS. What if your intercooler stops working? How much does it increase temperature and decrease power? In this video, we're gonna take a look at the effect of intercooler efficiency on a Turbo LS. Although we can extrapolate this to any turbo or supercharged combination. Now here's the way that I did it. We have a turbo LS and not just any turbo LS. It was a very cool one. It was kind of a short stroke, big bore turbo combination. And I've used it before previously in another video. So I'll go over all of those specs in just a minute. But here's what happened. We were running a turbo LS with an air to water intercooler. All I did was eliminate the water flow through the intercooler core raise the charge temperature and decrease the power. It's a very simple test. And you might be thinking, Richard, that's oddly specific. What am I gonna learn about intercooler efficiency from this test other than what happened on this application? Well, the reality is you can take this information and apply it to almost any force induction motor of any kind. If you look at an air to air or an air to water system, on an air to air system, we can reduce the efficiency by having less airflow. And that means if we have something in front of the air to air core, reduce the airflow, we reduce efficiency. If we have something behind the air to air intercooler, also reduce airflow, reduce efficiency. Maybe the tubing is too small. Maybe the end tanks are wrong. A lot of things can reduce the efficiency of an air to air core and you'll make less power. Same thing with an air to water. Now, the first thing we did obviously was eliminate the water flow through the core so we reduce the cooling. That's what happens on an air to water, but we can do it other ways too. Maybe the tanks are wrong. Maybe the core size is wrong. There are a lot of things that reduce that efficiency and also the secondary heat exchanger on an air to water system. If all of those go bad or they're not as efficient as they could be, your power is going to be down. The safety is going to be down. There's going to be a lot of problems. There's a lot of good stuff to learn from this test. So let's find out what happened when we reduced the, the water flow on our air to water intercooler on our turbo LS. Before we get to the test of our intercooler efficiency, let's start out with our turbo combination. And in fact, before we, we even get to the turbo combination, we're gonna start out with an NA application because what I did with this testing, I actually ran the motor naturally aspirated with an LS9 cam. It, it was a short stroke version of 4.8 stroke on an LS3 block. We have the LS9 cam in it. It had a set of trick flow 255 LS3, you know, CNC ported heads. It had a high RAM on it. So it was a pretty good combination. It was a short stroke deal designed to run at high RPM. We'd run it in another video for exactly that. In this combination, we had a milder cam in it, the factory LS9 cam. And we're gonna talk a little bit about when I go over the results of this test, why you could get away with that LS9 cam. It would be cheap, it's effective. You could make a ton of power. It's only limited by how much turbo you have. But we're gonna get into all of that. So we're gonna start off NA with an LS9 cam. Then we're gonna make some upgrades. I'll show you how much power we made when we put the turbo on, how much power we made when we did a cam upgrade. Then we can get to the intercooler test. Before we get to our intercooler test, let's talk a little bit about our naturally aspirated combination and then what happened when we added boost to it and why you may or may not want to change the camshaft. So this combination, as I said, was an LS3 block with a 4.8 liter crank and had Lenati rods in it, 6.38 inch rods and custom pistons. We had Trick Flow 255, the CNC ported rec port heads and a Holly High Ram. To get things started, because I was doing some turbo cam testing here, we started off with a factory LS9 camshaft and, and we ran it with long tube headers and a Holly HP management system and everything before we ran and before we ran boost on it. Because what I wanted to do is demonstrate how much power you could gain with a stage two type turbo cam over the factory LS9 cam. But we'll be able to talk about the results because it's kind of cool. So run in this manner our D-stroked LS3 basically or big bore 4.8 liter, however you want to look at it, made 512 horsepower. Peak torque checked in at 415 foot-pounds torque. So this thing did well, but here's what happened when we added our single turbo. It was a Precision 7675. We had DNA, uh, basically tubular stainless headers. I built a Y-pipe for it that I had two turbo smart wastegates. We had an air-to-water intercooler that we were running dyno water through. And we had um, the wastegate springs were set at like seven pounds. We had a manual controller on it. So I'll, I'll show you the boost curve and everything that's happening when we get into that. So here is our turbo combination with the LS9 cam. And it did well. It made right at 700 horsepower, 701 horsepower. And we had 598 foot-pounds of torque. So as you can see, it did very well. Um, but I want to show you what happened when we added a stage two cam. In this case, it was a stage two turbo cam from Brian Tooley Racing. And we made no changes to the wastegate or the controller or anything. We basically just ran it on the gate. And here's what happened when we installed the stage two turbo cam. 
it made more power, 733 horsepower compared to 701, or, or yeah, 701 horsepower. Uh, peak torque was up to 620 foot-pounds compared to the 598 with the LS9 cam. But now let's take a look at the boost curves on both of these, and we can talk a little bit about that, and then figure out, although we obviously one cam made more than the other, and as we'll find out, the BTR cam made more power at less boost, which is obviously a good combination, but would you really need to change the cam? It's going to depend on what kind of power output you want. Before getting to our intercooler test, I wanted to take a look at, I want to show you guys the boost curves of the two camshafts of the factory LS9 camshaft. And that's what this is. This is the boost curve supplied by our single turbo with a manual wastegate controller basically set at zero. This was kind of the run on the springs on the wastegates. So we had a peak of 9.4 pounds, but the, the boost fell off down to about 8 pounds out here at the top. Now here's what happened when we, after we installed the uh, Stage 2 cam for BTR. The boost actually was down slightly, and this looks like a lot because of the scaling here. This is about a half a pound, um, roughly. So we got 8.8 uh, .8 and 9.3. Yeah, it's almost exactly a half a pound. So it's not a lot, and a half a pound at this kind of power level is 12 to 15 horsepower, roughly. So what would happen is if we equalize the boost of these two, the Stage 2 cam would make about another 12 or 15 horsepower more than it already did over the factory LS9 cam. So it's not a big surprise that a more aggressive camshaft is going to make more power than a factory camshaft. That's not really that hard to do, even over a fairly good cam like the LS9. The question is, do you, would you need to do the upgrade? That's what I want you guys to comment on. Do, do you think you really need more power from that camshaft? And let me clarify that. Let's say that you have an S475 or an S480 turbo um, or a 7875 Gen 2 from, from Byron or something like that that's about a 1,000 horsepower turbo. You can get to 1,000 horsepower with either one of these camshafts. It will, it will do it at less boost, at a lower boost level, with this Stage 2 turbo cam from Brian Tui Racing. And it's a good cam, and we've used it a lot, and it works well. But you can also get there with the LS9 cam. So if you have one, and guys, since guys are selling those things fairly cheap, even a new one is fairly cheap, but the used ones are even cheaper, you can make all of the power that you want, although the LS9, in my opinion, is not ideal because it, it is soft down low. It has a really wide LSA, and it's going to make less power than other cams down low. But you could make a 1,000 horsepower with the LS9 cam without any problem on a 5.3, probably even a 4.8. It would just do it at a little bit higher RPM. But you could do that easily with any kind of LS and the right turbo. So that begs the question, do you need to upgrade to a different camshaft that we know will make more power? Not just a Stage 2 turbo cam, but a Stage 2 or Stage 1 or any other cam that we know is going to make more power than a factory one. You can make more power at any given boost level, but if you get to the limit of the turbo and you can get there with a cam that's less money, how many of you guys would rather just do that? <laughs> you know, because the difference in, in uh, power here between the two cams can be cured with another pound or a pound and a half of boost. And it's really easy to adjust the boost level. And it's a lot harder to, and a lot more expensive to put a camshaft in. So let me know in the comments, what do you guys think about that? Which way would you go if you knew that you were going to, that all you wanted to do was top out your turbo and you could get it with a less expensive cam? Which way would you go? Now let's take a look at our intercooler test. After covering the NA combination and then our turbo upgrade and then our turbo camshaft upgrade, we can finally get to our intercooler test. So here we are with our turbo combination with the single air to water intercooler. It's a three and a half in, three and a half out from CX Racing. It has a, or it has two fittings, basically an in and an out for the water. They're both three quarter pipe, basically. Not ideal. I would like to make them bigger. We can get even more flow rate through them, but this is the way the intercooler came, so this is the way we tested it. We were running about 82 or 83 degree uh, dyno water through the core, and it worked very well, and, and we've used it a lot in this configuration, and the only way, the only time we adjust it is when we run ice water through it, but we did not do that in this test. This was just dyno water. So we have our combination making 733 horsepower and 606 foot-pounds of torque with our single turbo, and this is with water flowing through the core. And we're going to go over the changes in boost and the changes in temperature after we take a look at the power gains. So here's what happened when we shut the water off, no water flowing through the core. We saw a fairly good drop in power down to 707 horsepower, 
Torque was down to 584 foot-pounds. We saw a fairly consistent gain of about 30 horsepower or so and a similar amount of torque kind of all the way through the curve. Now, obviously, that's a, there's a change in charge temperature, which we're going to go over, but there's also a, there was a slight change in boost because, again, I did not have an electronic controller for this. I had a manual controller, and we'll show, I'll show you what the change in boost was and why we could not just adjust it manually with our... Our, our bleed valve. So let's take a look at the boost and take a look at the charge temperature. But remember, we've got about a 30 horsepower difference in power. After taking a look at the power output and the power difference between having water flowing through our inner core core and not having, we should take a look at the boost curve because at least some of the power change can be attributed to a change in boost, although the change in boost was not dramatic and you guys can make comments about that. I can, I can talk about that a little bit. <laughs> So this is our um, this is our boost curve with water flowing through the inner core, and here's what happened when we had no water flowing through the core. As you can see, the boost was down slightly with no water, and it's hard to see from the scale here, but this is about three or four tenths of a pound, so less than half a pound, which on this power output is probably 10 or 12 horsepower maybe. So some of the difference can be attributed to um, the difference in boost, but only in this range where there's a difference from 6,000 out to 7,000 RPM, there's effectively no change in boost, and there's still that same kind of change in power. So it lets me think that the big change in power here is not solely attributed to a change in boost pressure. And this is also why I could not adjust this with a manual controller. If I adjusted it with a manual controller, we could maybe bring these up so that they're even, but the problem is we would have more from 6,000 on out. So then people would be saying, well, there's more boost out there. So, so you know, so you can have an even amount of boost and the power is going to be. So they're basically arguing no matter what. The only way to cure this would be for me to have an electronic controller where the boost is consistently flat at eight and a half pounds all the way out. And then it would be that way in both combinations. But as we see, there is definitely a change in power from the change in temperature because we saw we did adjust the air fuel. There was no adjustment to the timing. The timing was exactly the same. The air fuel was the same. This we saw as a slight change in boost. And now let's take a look at the change in temperature. These two curves represent the changes in charge temperature during the run. And all of this obviously is after the intercooler actually in the uh, intake manifold. And we measured temperature there in both cases and run with the intercooler. We're starting out about 97 degrees and it rose a little bit to 99 almost 100 and then dipped down and and if you take a look at if we take a look at other runs we had a similar thing we had a different starting point um, because we ran this test we ran the the water intercooler test right after we ran the non intercooled test and i think had we waited a little bit we would have we would have had a lower starting temperature kind of like we had on this run that i'm showing you down here this is with the the btr cam and, but we see a similar thing. We see the temperature rising slightly, and then we see it dip, and then we see it rise again. Now, if we look up here on the run in the green with a run made without water flowing through the core, we see a um, slow rise and then a more dramatic rise starting at about 5,700 RPM, despite the fact, and this is interesting, that we're seeing a rise in temperature, despite the fact that we saw a drop in boost pressure, which obviously the temperature goes up with boost, but as the boost is going down, we shouldn't see a rise in temperature, but we will. Some of that is the response rate of the type K thermal couple that we're using. This run represents about 10 or 11 seconds worth of running um, if you don't count the load in and the load off of the dyno. Um, the, the run itself is about 11 seconds. But um, we definitely would see a rise in temperature. And if we and the thing is, this was one run. If we made successive runs, like if we were to make another run right after that, we would have an even higher starting point and an even higher finishing point um, up to the point where we got to a saturation level where we just weren't, weren't going to have any more temperature. But having an intercooler <laughs> obviously is good. Uh, not having one obviously is not good. And in this case, we had an intercooler and there was wa residual water in there. We didn't eliminate all of the water in there. So it, it, it was doing some cooling. Um, if we were to run this without an intercooler, we would have an even higher higher levels of temperature, but it shows that even not having, you know, having a less efficient intercooler, even though you have one, is still not good, and it's worth power if you have everything functioning right. Not only that, and something that doesn't show in this test, because we had good fuel running in this thing, and we weren't going to hurt it, 
but you've changed the safety level, you've changed the detonation threshold, you've changed a lot of things by not by having an elevated charge temperature, in this case of about 35 or 40 degrees, depending on where you measure it. So that's a big change. Big change in power, big change in safety. The takeaway, ultra and intercooler. Okay guys, what do you think about the results of our intercooler test on our turbocharged LS combination? First of all, I like all of the testing here. I like that we started out NA. I like the discussion about using the LS9 cam because any cam is a turbo cam. And if you have any kind of camshaft other than a stock LM7 or LR4 cam, any cam that you put in there will usually allow you to get to the limit of some kind of turbo. So you can get away with a cheap cam. You don't even have to have a dedicated turbo cam or a more expensive cam. You can get to where you need to go if you put a thousand horsepower turbo on it. You have a good cam. You don't need this short stroke, really expensive LS3 headed thing. You could do it in on a 5.3 or a 4.8 with an LS9 cam, put a thousand horsepower turbo and you have a thousand horsepower. So that's a very easy way to do it. We didn't need to do the cam upgrade. Although the flip side of that is if you want to make power, you put a camshaft in it that makes more power and a, it will also make more power under boost. So if I only want to run 10 pounds of boost and I want to make as much power as I can at that 10 pounds of boost, having a good cam in it and not the factory LS9 cam is a good way to go. But ultimately that decision is yours. On the intercooler test, obviously <laughs> higher charge temperatures are bad, less power is bad, more safety is definitely good always run an intercooler and make sure that you do everything that you can to make the intercooler as efficient as possible. I'm Richard Holder. Make sure to like, share, subscribe, ring the bell, do all that stuff, and I'll keep testing.